Isn't that tricky? Here we go. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the inaugural event of the Robert Talbot Civil Rights Speaker Series. Uh, greetings to all of those of, who are here at the University of Maine in the audience, those of you who are watching the live stream or watching it, uh, the recording after we post it, and also to those of you who are listening on uh, radio station WERU-FM. Uh, we really are, uh, appreciate your interest in this topic. Uh, my name is John Diamond. I'm the president and CEO of the University of Maine Alumni Association. We are an independent, self-governing organization that's been around since 1875. And our mission is to serve the social, educational, uh, professional, and career interests and needs of our members, 110,000 members, uh, half of whom live in Maine. We also work hard to advocate for the resources that the university needs in order to strengthen the quality, the value, the affordability, and the reputation of a humane education. Uh, once again, we are pleased to partner with the Greater Bangor Area Branch of the NAACP to bring you this program. Uh, I want to welcome uh, uh, our, uh, the NAACP's president, Michael Alpert. You'll be hearing from him in just a moment. One of the things I forgot to do was to turn the, the clicker on to advance it. Uh, back in early January, Michael and I were discussing our friend Bob Talbot and his extraordinary leadership and impact in Maine and how we might publicly acknowledge it. We came up with the concept of an annual civil rights speaker series. And through the Alumni Association and the University of Maine Foundation, we established a special fund uh, that would enable us to bring to Orono nationally relevant speakers, like the ones we're going to hear from today, and to make sure that the programming that we do is accessible to all, free of charge. Many thanks to those of you who are both here present and also watching tonight. Uh, it's different from what you see in the printed program. Ambassador Molly and Dana was going, from Penobscot Nation was going to be here tonight to bring greetings from Penobscot Nation, but she had a family issue that she had to deal with and had to cancel out at the last minute. Uh, she sends her, her greetings, though, and her regrets for not being here. Uh, also, UMaine President Joan Farini Mundy was going to be here, and she was called to Washington on university business. So she, I think, is probably, I don't know if she's landed yet in DC, but she was in transit to DC earlier today. So she too extends her regrets. But also, I should point out that she sent a pinch hitter. And I, I'm uncomfortable using any kind of baseball term after the way the Red Sox have performed the last two games. <laughs> But we have a good pinch hitter there, and that is uh, Vice President Robert Dana. As you can see on the screen, he's the Vice President for Student Life and Inclusive Excellence on campus, as well as being the Dean of Students. So uh, I would, uh, again, Robert's an alum of the University of Maine. We're very fortunate to have him as the, I think, the longest serving senior administrator on campus. He can correct me when he gets up here if that's not the case, but I think that he right now has the uh, the most seniority among the members of the administration. So with that, I ask you to welcome uh, Vice President Bob Dana. Uh, well, you're exactly correct, though. My uh, hair has been white like this for the last 35 years, so not much is changing. So thank you so much to the Alumni Association and uh, to our friends at the Bangor area in AACP. It's such a wonderful <clears throat> alliance that's uh, developing. And welcome all of you to the University of Maine. I see so many friends here in the audience. And I'm reminded of all the times we get to come together to discuss important issues in the uh, world's view of uh, diversity and inclusion, equity, justice. And tonight is one of those. And this is a particular honor because Bob Talbot's a dear friend of mine, and uh, he has been a stalwart for uh, the city of Bangor, our region, uh, certainly for the university. So, Bob, it's uh, wonderful to have you here. As an interesting aside, um, as uh, John pointed out, I've only been here 37 years in my professional uh, capacity, 
but before that, I was a, a student here, and I met my wife here. And we studied with Professor Banks. We studied Maine history, in fact. And my wife is um, a mathematician, but she's gone on to have a wonderful uh, relationship from his writings uh, with the rest of her family. So uh, it's a gr great honor to be here to, uh, to see his family and to talk about this most important man. Before I uh, say anything else, I do want to acknowledge, of course, that we're sitting on some very sacred uh, ground here. This event is taking place on Marsh Island. It is in the heart of the Penobscot Nation's homeland. It was the Penobscot Nation's homeland. Tonight's program includes the university's land acknowledgement. It's a statement that recognizes that the Penobscot Nation and other Wabanaki tribal nations are distinct, sovereign, legal, and political entities. They have their own powers of self-governance and self-determination. The university embraces our, and celebrates our students, our faculty, our staff who are from indigenous populations. We celebrate our indigenous neighbors and we celebrate and venerate uh, the land on which we walk. And if you haven't had an opportunity to traverse campus lately, you'll see that we're undertaking a great um, project and that is putting the uh, Wabanaki names on all of our buildings and streets. And Professor uh, Darren Ranko, another dear friend, has uh, helped us get going on that, and we're getting going. It's uh, a wonderful, uh, wonderful thing. Well, tonight we're talking about reconciliation, compassion, human justice, and I don't think there's anything more important for a college or a university to be considering. We could talk about diversity, equity, and inclusion, but at its root is the notion of kindness, compassion, caring, and love. And we know every day that we teach our students about the importance of commitment and connection, the value of giving, the value of taking appropriately, that we've made them better people. So tonight you'll hear the story about great reconciliation, compassion. You'll hear about painful healing. You'll hear about going the long distance to not turning the other cheek, but making the other cheek mindful that there are other people on the other side. So I'm very honored to be here. I bring the president's uh, deepest regrets. Uh, she's either on a plane or jumping off it now. And if she's uh, been able to get to a uh, portal, she'll be uh, joining us, I know, on the live stream. I bring the uh, thanks and acknowledgement of our provost, John Vollen, who is a committed uh, patriot in the uh, fight for justice and equality. I welcome all of you. I'm thrilled to death you're here, and thank you so very much. <clears throat> okay. Dr. Dana noted the land acknowledgement, and uh, uh, those of you who are here at Wells, and I think on the stream too, will see that the, the language there of the land acknowledgement is on our screen, and uh, uh, you can read the language there. I appreciate the, the fact that uh, uh, we have such a good relationship as, I mean, in a building relationship, both as a university, but also as an alumni association. Um, we're. Uh, grateful for the involvement of the, and the leadership that our alumni play in leading roles in Maine's indigenous uh, communities and also our own relationship with the leaders of UMaine's Native Study Program and the Wabanaki Center. We've done some alumni programs with them. We will be doing more programs with them. So now I'd like to introduce uh, the aforementioned Michael Alpert. Uh, Michael is the president of the Greater Bangor Area Branch at the NAACP, but he has a day job, and that day job is as the director of the University of Maine Press. He's a longtime friend of the namesake of our Civil Rights Speaker Series, and here to offer some reflections on Bob Talbot is Michael Alpert. Thank you. Oops.
Thank you, John. Let me move this down. <laughs> On behalf of the Greater Bangor Area Branch NAACP, I welcome you to this first event in the Robert Talbot Civil Rights Speaker Series. Uh, the series is named after Robert, or Bob as we all call him, and I know many of you have met Bob, but you may not know of his long engagement uh, in social justice and civil rights. Now, I'm going to read from a text because I don't want to skip anything. This is a, this is a long list of accomplishments, and I, I, I want to include it all. In the early and mid-1960s, Bob and I were members of the original Bangor NAACP. That was a time when civil rights activists, including young activists like us, were confronting what we hoped, then hoped, were the last vestiges of racial segregation. In those years, the Bangor branch was focused on a much needed Maine fair housing law which was, after much effort, two years of effort, enacted by the state. This was before the federal fair housing law. The law was especially needed in Bangor because the community included many African American Air Force personnel assigned to Bangor's Dow Air Force Base. These black service people were living in barracks on the base because they could not find any available rental housing in Bangor or the surrounding area for their families. At that time, Central Maine's housing practice was blatantly racist. During those years, Bob was a very dignified and obviously intelligent young leader. In the decades that followed, he has retained character traits that all who knew him admired. His activism has included serving as the first director of the Maine Human Rights Commission from its inception in the 1960s until 1974. For 23 years, Bob worked as an investigator, an equal opportunity specialist for the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services in its regional office in Boston. Concurrently, he served as president of the employee union representing all DHHS employees in New England. In recent years, Bob has been a member of the Maine Human Rights Advisory Committee and has served on the board of directors of the NAACP, both the Bangor branch and the New England Regional Conference, and on the board of directors of the ACLU of Maine. This is a partial list. I, I, I'll add only that the Greater Bangor Area Branch NAACP would not exist without Bob's commitment to racial justice. He has guided the branch as it has intervened in schools, police departments, and other institutions throughout the state and ad, as it has confidentially helped individuals when faced with racist language and aggression. Bob's adult life has been dedicated to freedom. The wonderful speakers this afternoon will tell you how injustice can lead to the loss of freedom. People in civil rights know that freedom is always situated, always situated freedom. Freedom never exists as an abstraction or in a vacuum. It is always tied to specific situations. The goal of civil rights organizations such as the NAACP is to change America's cultural and political situation so that lasting freedom can include all of us. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mike, Michael. Uh, 
I want to mention, if it's not obvious already, that our namesake, Bob Talbot, is here as are members of his family. Bob, if, uh, I know you've got a bit of a mobility issue now, but if you wouldn't mind standing and waving, I think there are people who would like to recognize you. Also, there are, there's at least one, possibly two members of the Talbot family that I'd like to single out as well. Uh, like Bob, both of them are longtime and very prominent civil rights and political leaders in the state of Maine. Uh, one is sitting right to Bob's right, his older brother, Jerry Talbot. Uh, Jerry, we're very honored to have you here today, too. And the other is, is Jerry's daughter, Bob's niece, uh, Rachel Talbot Ross. I don't think she's arrived yet. Uh, family members, can you tell? And I, she's coming. She's coming. Okay. Yep, that's good. So I, I, I think you told me that she often will make an entrance. Uh, only <laughs> time that she does not know time sometimes. But anyway, she's a terrific uh, leader in the state. She's the assistant majority leader of the Maine House of Representatives, and uh, again, former city councilor in Portland. Lots of different positions. Uh, so uh, she'll be here, and hopefully, people will get a chance to mingle with her as well. But thank you to all the Talbot family because it's a family affair that uh, you've been able to support Bob, Jerry, and Rachel, and the others in the family, so thank you. And now for our special guests. Uh, by registering for this event this evening, you should be aware of their story, so, and they will fill in a lot of the gaps here. In 1979, a 16-year-old Isaac Knapper was arrested for the murder in New Orleans of University of Maine history professor Ronald Banks. Uh, professor Banks was in New Orleans to attend an academic conference. And it was a random act of violence that took his life. It occurred literally in front of the hotel he was staying in. Despite the existence of evidence that should have cleared Isaac, he was wrongfully convicted of the murder and sentenced to life in prison. But 13 years later, thanks to advocates who believed in Isaac's innocence, he was exonerated and released after it was revealed that the prosecutors had suppressed evidence that should have cleared him of the crime at the very beginning. Professor Banks' daughter, Amy Banks, was also 16 at the time of her father's murder. 26 years later, she and Isaac met for the first time, and together they worked to process the horrific circumstances of the murder and the judicial failures that allowed for Isaac's wrongful conviction. Now they're close friends and advocates for racial justice and criminal justice reform. The two have collaborated on the book Fighting Time. And as reviewer Jennifer Thompson wrote, quote, Fighting Time is not just a book about the injustice of a wrongful conviction, but it's a love story of the capacity of human beings to find power in pain and healing in the harm. They will tell their story in much more detail, but please join me in welcoming our speakers, Dr. Amy Banks and Mr. Isaac Knapper. I think for the purposes of the stream, we might need you to have the microphones up a little closer so people can hear you. Uh, okay. There. Can, can you hear me? Can, can you hear that? Is that? Yeah. yeah, it's okay. Okay. We'll just have to uh, speak up, I think. You want to just make sure everybody can hear you? Yes. Can, can everybody hear? hear me? Okay. 
So honestly, um, folks, that if you really can't hear at some point, would you, you know, somebody stick up a hand and say, speak up, okay? I know it's a, it, it, we've got word that the, uh, that there's some deadening happening with the sound. So I just want to make sure people can hear. Um, first and foremost, I want, um, I want to acknowledge um, what, an, two honors that I have, two honors in, in uh, being here tonight. And the first is to be able to share the stage uh, another time with my uh, dear friend and co-author Isaac Knapper. Um, he, this is a man that I love dearly uh, and respect even more. Uh, and you. our journey has been transformative to me. Uh, it's likely that I will get emotional <laughs> a number of times during our talk tonight. Um, so thank you for coming to Maine. And thank you for being on this journey with me. It's uh, amazing. Thank you. thank you for having me. Yeah. I really appreciate it. Yeah, that's great. The second thing I want to say is to be able to do an inaugural lecture for uh, Robert Talbert um, is just a profound honor. So thank you. Um, Amy, is your mic working now? Is mine not, now not working? Maybe if you put it on your other lapel, I think it might. Uh, All right, let's give that a try. Is that any better? Yes. You sure? Okay. Okay. Great. <laughs> I'm going to keep asking. Are you sure that's okay? Mm. Anyway, so what we're going to do um, today is sort of walk you through our story. Um, it, it's obviously been a, uh, a long story. I want to make one correction to what John Diamond said. Um, we actually, Isaac and I, met 30, uh, 36 years after the murder. So we have known each other about six years. Um, and, and you'll hear part of the story of uh, how that came to be. Um, but we are six years into the relationship. We found out, and my family did, that he got exonerated after, uh, at about year 26. Um, we have a PowerPoint, so we're going to jump in with that. Um, she says, as she clicks the wrong place. Um, I'm going to start by saying uh, to be at the University of Maine, Orno, <laughs> to be giving this talk, is um, it, it, it feels like my life has just come full circle. Um, this was, uh, you know, when you're, when you're the child of an academic, um, you know, you, you spend a lot of time at the university, right? Uh, I was, uh, you know, up until age three, I was in University Park, right? Uh, getting the, the peanuts and the, you know, walking through the trails behind the things. That was a, a typical weekend family activity. Um, I went to basketball camp at the University of Maine every single year of my life until I left home. So, um, you know, my family's life was uh, interwoven with everything at the University of Maine, Orono. So, uh, you know, it feels like coming home. Uh, and uh, it was a home that, um, you know, when, when my father was murdered, um, kind of blew up in our face. Um, so let's start, we'll start the story there. Um, and I also want to acknowledge that there are a fair min min number of people here. And forgive me, I'll settle down at some point. It's just it's very emotional for me to be here. Um, <clears throat> there's a number of people here, uh, actually, in, in the audience who uh, were actually very much a part of my life and my family's life at the actual time that my father was murdered. And to each one of you, thank you for all you did and the ways that you helped uh, our family. When I was 16, and Isaac was 16, <clears throat> my father, he just turned 17 when my father was murdered. Uh, you know, as John said, he went, uh, left on a Thursday uh, to a conference in New Orleans. Uh, you know, he traveled a lot. It was a trip that uh, none of it, nobody in my family thought twice about. You know, he was always traveling for something. He had been very involved in the Indian land claims case at the time. So, you know, his traveling wasn't, wasn't, uh, wasn't a problem. <laughs> until it was a problem, right? Um, but at the time, you know, I, I think this picture sort of captures, I mean, this, is, this was front, front and center in my life, basketball, right? That's what I was focused on. Um, and on the, other, on the other side, I mean, it, you know, it's again, capturing how young we are. And Isaac, I don't know if you want to say something about your side of the picture here that we put up, um, where that was taken. Yes, well, uh, thank you everyone for having me. Uh, and this picture right here, I was in Louisiana State Penitentiary 
at Angola. Some of you probably heard of that place. It was the bloodiest penitentiary in America. And I was in the cell block. That area in that penitentiary was the worst area uh, in the penitentiary. And I was 17 years old, uh, a promising boxer before all this here happened. I was nine years old when I started boxing. So uh, in order to escape reality, and to uh, ease my mind, to relieve some pain, I continued to box since it was something real huge in Angola. Boxing was big there. And I went on to, uh, to start the boxing there and held the boxing title in Angola for 13 years. Uh, but like Amy said, yeah. at 17, she was in school yeah. playing basketball, had a career, and at 17, I was in penitentiary fighting for my life yeah. for a crime I didn't commit. Yeah. So, uh, hold on. There is a, so that night, um, this is a picture actually taken from, uh, I think it's the Times-Picayune. Um, about 9.15 that night, my father and John Hackler, also a professor from the university, were returning from the French Quarter. Uh, to their hotel, and uh, just as they were about to go into the door, um, two, uh, you know, by by witnesses' accounts, uh, two young men were um, held up. Both of them, John Hackler was uh, shoved in through the doorway, lost his glasses, didn't get a, a good look at either one of the criminals. Uh, my father put up a, a small fight, uh, as, as I like to say. I don't think he actually meant to fight these guys. I think he was just so taken off guard, um, you know, and as as uh, has been passed down to the family through the years. Um, you know, he said, you've got to be kidding, which was so classic of my father, of what, how we would have reacted. Um, and unfortunately, uh, at that moment, was shot directly in the face. Um, this was the front page of the Port Portland Press Herald. Um, as most of you know, uh, you know, these kinds of things didn't happen much in Maine, right? Uh, we didn't have any uh, exposure to murder. and. The other thing that I want to I want to point out, and this is, um, you know, this is a it's a wrongful conviction story. It's a you know it's a healing story, but it's also a huge story about racism, right? And systemic racism. Um, and at the time, my family, we didn't talk about race because because we didn't I want to say didn't need to. There were no black people. I had one black student in my, you know, in, in our high school of 1300. So, you know, and that, I don't say that as an excuse as to why my family would have swallowed hook, line, and sinker, the information that was coming out of Louisiana, but it's the only defense I have, <laughs> right? So uh, that, you know, my family that night, it was, uh, you know, just a, as anybody can imagine, I I've described it in the book, but it was um, just a, a horrific night. We found out friends my uh, parents' very dear friends, Charlie Scontras, who was a professor at UMO, and his wife, uh, John Hackler, had called her, told her. They drove up and uh, told my family at about 11 o'clock at night. And needless to say, we were up for days on end after that, trying to deal with the aftermath. Um, it was shocking. Uh, it was traumatic. It was everything you could imagine <laughs> it to be. So, you know, we woke up the next morning to this. Um, this in the paper. So as time went on, so one of the things I want to say is quite early on in the process, um, you know, we, you know, again, there weren't, at that time, there weren't vi victim advocates, right? They, we, you know, trauma has come so long, so far in the years since uh, 1979 in terms of knowing what people might need. Uh, we didn't know any of that. And so we were just getting, uh, you know, information from uh, detectives and whatnot down in, in uh, Louisiana, you know, and so we went through the funeral right down at the Newman Center here at, at UMO. Um, everything was here, and, you know, we're trying to just kind of chug along in our life. And this was a picture that came up. This was the first time I had any interaction with Isaac Knapper. This was a picture that came, popped up in the Bangor Daily no News. We didn't, our family didn't even know an arrest had been made. Um, but all of a sudden, I, I looked at the paper, and here's this guy, Isaac, Isaac Knapper. And Isaac, do you want to say a little bit about that, that picture? Well, on that picture there, uh, in fact, 
I was arrested. They came to my mom. I was living with my mom, living in a housing projects called the uh, Melphamine Housing Projects in New Orleans. And uh, when they came to the house, I was actually in the bed, sleep, and but I heard the banging on the door. You know how you sleep and you're conscious. My mom went to answer the door, and it was the the police. They come to the house. They uh, told my mom, said, uh, where is Isaac? Isaac Napper. My mom said, my son, he's, he's asleep. I uh, said, well, he's getting arrested for murder. And my mama said, murder? Uh, my son didn't kill anybody. What, what? He said, yes, he did. And we come to get him. So from there, they pushed my mom to the side. They forced their way in a room where I were uh, in the bed, sleep. And uh, I woke up with guns pointing in my face. And when they uh, got me up, had my underwear on, got out of the bed, they told me turn around, they put cuffs on me, and my mom said, hold up, hold up, let's talk. And my son didn't kill anybody, but they didn't want to hear what my mom had to say. Uh, they uh, was determined to get me uh, to the prison. Well. When they was taking me out the house, my mom said, hold up, wait, let my son, at least let him put on some clothes. They said, no, if you want him with clothes, bring clothes to the prison. They took me to jail in my underwear. So on this picture, I was coming out of um, a place called a house of detention. And that's where my mom brought these clothes at, to the house of detention for me to put on. So, and uh, when I was after, putting these clothes on, leaving out of the house of detention, going over to Paris prison. Uh, that's when that picture was, was taken and uh, with this guy, Detective John Dillman. And John Dillman happened to be uh, the detective who um, arrested me for that crime. Uh, mm -hmm. So Isaac, he, he arrested you for the crime and once he was arrested for the cr crime, what we started getting, my family started getting, is is the um, uh, uh, we got you know calls, we got information. I mean, basically, they they said to us uh, they were certain they had the right guy. This was a guy they were had been looking for. They've been trying to get him for a number of years. I mean, and mind you, this, this this is a 16 year old boy, right? They told our family he had an extensive juvenile record. This you know he they, no doubt you know and. You know, we're we're in Maine. We don't know any different, and you know, so we're believing it, right? We're okay. Yep, this is, this is the guy, right? Um, and the certainty with which they uh, told us it was the guy was um, pretty astounding, right? No no doubt whatsoever. Um, and so, you know, that's that's the first time I, I want to say that Isaac, that you became associated with my father's murder, right? right. In my own in my own brain, quite right. quite literally. Um, and I wonder, you know, I think maybe to share, I'll, I'll go on to the next, what happened after that arrest? Um, well, after I got arrested, uh, they, uh, well, in fact, the same day, late on that, that night, they came to interrogate me. And when they come in to get me, they brought me to an office. Uh, and it was about maybe about six of them, along with that guy, Detective John Dillman. They was trying to get me to admit to committing that crime. And I asked them, why are y'all doing this? I didn't kill anybody. I don't know what you're talking about. Why do you have me here? And so they was like, you know you did it. You did it, and you, you're going to get sentenced to the death. We're going to kill you. You will die in the electric chair. Uh, now, we know that uh, they have this legal injection thing, but back then it was the electric chair. And he said, you will die in the electric chair. And some of them was claiming that uh, that Dr. Banks was their friend. Uh, one guy, he said, that was my friend. You killed, punched me in the chest, you know, knocked me down. Uh, and they was doing these things while I was cuffed. I had my hands behind my back cuffed. I had shackles on my leg. And they even went far as putting a bag over my head. And they would throw books and knock me out of the chair. They started kicking me and stomping me. And I never would understand. They never would touch my face. 
they was just beating my body because from what I understand, they're not supposed to touch a juvenile. Uh, if they gonna abuse you, yes, mentally they can do it, but physically they're not supposed to put their hands on you. And that was the reason they didn't touch my face uh, and they beat my body. And in this picture right here, they had broke my ribs on the left side and on the right side they fractured my ribs and so I was urine blood and so they, when they brought me to the hospital, that's Charity Hospital in New Orleans and on the forward flow, they had to take swollen glands, blood clots out of my body from where they was kicking me and, uh, and stomping me, trying to get me to confess to a crime that I had no knowledge of and didn't have no idea why they was doing this. They arrested another guy that was, uh, I guess he was 17 or 18 years old, Leroy Williams. And when they arrested him, he uh, was supposed to have been the one that told him that I committed this crime. And But I, at the time, I didn't know who, why, and where, what was going on. But uh, it came down to it that uh, Leroy Williams, he pled guilty to, uh, to the crime, and but he also accused me as being the one that shot uh, Professor Banks. And, uh, but like Amy said, when, when, when the report came after about 11 years, we received the investigative report that showed that they had actually arrested about 12 people for that crime. And uh, I was the only one got convicted for it, and they gave me natural life. They tried me as an adult and gave me natural life without parole, probation, or suspension of sentence after they continued to, uh, to beat me every day. Mm. And, we, you know, one of the things that I, that I want to say is chime in, you know, sort of um, the parallel storylines, right? So in my family what's happening is um, the trial for the for your trial was in October, and what was happening over the summer is you know things were, you know, relatively quiet. We'd get little reports back and forth, and then as the trial was about to approach, we actually were getting information. Um, the the uh, detectives and, and such were sending information saying yeah, you you might have to prepare yourself that that this guy's going to get off, right? We know he did it, but we don't have uh, enough evidence to prove it, right? And then uh, my understanding was about a week before the tri trial, and correct me if I'm wrong, but about a week before the trial, all of a sudden there was, you know, we had gotten a call, oh, everything's going to be okay, um, that Leroy Williams had decided to turn state's evidence against Isaac. He admitted to being there, and in fact he, had, he uh, said they were both there, um, but that Isaac had done the shooting. So now, we have an, now they had an eyewitness um, a person who was actually there, who was involved, you know, by his own self-admission uh, in the crime, uh, but he put it on you. And you know, one of the things that, you know, to me, as as this story kind of unfolds, is is so deeply mi moving to me, right? And okay, pause right there for a second. Um, if this story sounds um, outlandish, um, I want you to know it isn't. And if you study, if you look at um, any of the literature on wrongful conviction, this is par for the course. There are layers and layers and layers a, a, around how wrongful convictions happen. Prosecution misconduct is one of them, right? One of them, but there are many of them. So, but they, they went to Isaac also and gave him a deal and said, if you will, um, we know Leroy Williams did the crime, and if you will testify against him, then you're gonna get a less sentence. So they're basically, you know, Put, pitting them against each other. Leroy Williams took the bait and said, yes, I'll, I'll testify. And Isaac, yeah. you... You know, I refused to, uh, to lie. And Leroy, they came to me and they said, look, we know, we know that you didn't kill this guy. They said, we know Leroy Williams did it. But we need you in order for us to prove Beyond a reasonable doubt that Leroy Williams committed this crime, we need you to testify against him, and we would let you go. You would probably get a couple of years of probation or whatever, but you won't get the death sentence, and you definitely won't get a life sentence. You'll get home 
back to your family. And I said, no, I'm not going to do that. They said, and the guy told me, he said, now, you have a chance now. If you don't do it, we will go to Leroy, and Leroy will do it. So they actually let me know that they just want one of us to admit uh, and, and tell on the other one. They don't care if it's a lie. It didn't matter to them if it was a lie or not. They just wanted to get a conviction to clean the records up. And it has a lot to do, I believe, with racism uh, because Leroy was black. I'm black from out of the projects, you know, and uh, we was accused of killing a white guy. And so everything in the courtroom, the prosecutors, the judge, everything in the courtroom was white. So it was like they didn't care. They just wanted a conviction. And they wanted one, uh, me or Leroy to get convicted or either both of us get convicted. And even though they came to me with a deal before they went to Leroy and I refused. And when they, my lawyer come, spoke with me and he told me, he said, look, Leroy is gonna testify against you. He said, now what you gonna do if he testify against you, you gonna probably get the death sentence or you gonna get a life sentence. You'll never see the streets again. And he said, now you got a chance. You still have a chance. I can go speak with the prosecutors if you would testify against him. And I told him, I said, well, whatever happened, uh, it just have to happen. I'm not gonna lie. I don't know if Leroy committed that crime or not. I don't know why Leroy uh, is pointing the finger at me, but I'm not going to point the finger back at him because I don't know if he did it or not. And I continue to stick with that right now. I refuse uh, to lie on Leroy Williams because I don't know if he did it or not right now today as we speak. You know? And so Leroy, they told him the same thing, and Leroy took the he And you can tell from his testimony that it was rehearsed. You know, uh, They told him everything to say, and he said what they told him to say and I got convicted for first degree murder. I'm gonna, I'm gonna embellish that a little bit more and add to it. Uh, this is a picture of the courthouse um, that I like to say so much stuff happened. This was the courthouse that Isaac was uh, convicted in. Uh, to the left there is a picture of the Orleans Parish prison where he was held prior to the trial. This also happens to be the place that Nancy, uh, Nancy, my sister Nancy Banks and uh, Isaac's wife, Denise Clayton, and Lori White got together further along in the story. It was a one-day trial, right? I remember um, I didn't go. My brother went. My uncle went. Um, but the rest of my family didn't go. Uh, it was just uh, too traumatic. Um, but we expected, I expected anyway, that the trial would last. You know, it's a murder trial, right? It's going to last a week. It's going to last a couple of weeks, you know? I mean, O.J. Simpson's lasted, what, a year? Um, Isaac's trial lasted one day. He was tried in one day, convicted and sentenced to life in prison without parole yes. in one day. I remember uh, what, what, what we got from my brother um, was, you know, of course, m our family was happy. I mean, not happy. I mean, you're not ever happy, but you think, okay, this justice has been served. This guy who has killed our father. There, there, was, a, there was some remoteness again uh, around it. I, you know, I never really felt, um, you know, like I say to Isaac, I didn't feel angry at you. I just, you know, I didn't even know what to think. But, you know, there was some sort of sense of closure. Um, okay, this happened. It was awful. But, you know, yeah. Isaac Knapper did it. He's in prison. You know, let's try to get on with our lives. Um, my brother came home and told the story of Isaac's family. And it was something that's always stayed with me. Just, I mean, my entire uh, life just horrified that when the verdict was read, yeah. that your family, there was just literally wailing, yeah, wailing. Yes. They were so distraught, right? Yeah. Um, you know, my mom started screaming, and she passed out. She fainted. My sister started screaming, and judge attitude, he said, get them out of my courtroom right now. Get them out of my courtroom. And they literally had to pick my mom up and told her out the courtroom. And he said, now close that door. Now go on. And that was the attitude he had. Um, ironically, on this building, 
that all of this happened, the trial happened. You know, when, when Nancy and I uh, finally went down to New Orleans to meet Isaac and, and Denise, um, we were walking around the building. Actually, that's Nancy, my sister Nancy, over in the corner there. Uh, don't know how she snuck into the picture. But literally across that building is this, you know, rather ironic statement, the impartial administration of justice is the foundation of liberty. Um, you know, that I found that hard to take. These next three slides, I, I, I just want um, to give you a snapshot of what was going on in New Orleans at the time in the criminal justice system. This is Henry Connick Sr. He was a district attorney, and he... Uh, Harry. What? Harry Connick. Harry, Harry, sorry, Jesus. <laughs> I am besmirching somebody's uh, reputation. Harry Connick Sr. Um, he, he oversaw one of the most corrupt um, district attorney offices, I think, in, in all of the United States. And these are some of his quotes. My reputation is he was being accused of, you know, setting people up of wrongful convictions, and there were a number of really famous ones that came out of, out of, uh, his, uh, under his wing. Yeah. He says, my reputation is based on something other than a case or two cases or five cases or one interception or 20 interceptions, right? Like, he, he moves off into sports metaphors because why not? Um, he says, look at the rest of my record. I have more years than anybody, oh, Connick nice. said. Would you make it the legacy of Hank Aaron or Babe Ruth that they struck out a lot? He went on, I have to look at myself and say, this is who I am. This is what I've done. Perfect? No. But I've not, I've not done, I've done nothing to go to confession about in that office at all. That is just sickening to me. This is Ruth Ginsburg, Bader Ginsburg, um, uh, responding to him. Uh, Ginsburg declared Connick's office deliberately indifferent to Brady, Brady versus Maryland. That was the um, 1963 High Court decision requiring the state to turn over exculpatory evidence. Um, she wrote that the office, office's instructions on the Brady material, like the people have to turn over exculpatory ev evidence, um, that, uh, what did she say here? Okay, the instructions on Brady and similar court rulings uh, amounted to little more than four sentences in a manual. That Connick himself misunderstood the law and that his cavalier attitude spurred a culture of inattention to defendants' rights. This is what was good. This was, this was the environment in which Isaac was tried for in one day. He rebuts Ginsburg in, um, in true... Uh, fashion to su suggest a criminal lawyer in my office didn't know of their obligation to turn over Brady material is absurd it's such a naive statement Connick said I can't attribute malice to the those decisions as some people do as the dissenters in the Supreme Court do uh, particularly Ginsburg it reaches a level of hysteria uh, what's burning in that woman is a very liberal flame that doesn't contemplate the whole picture so you can imagine that your chances of getting a fair trial so Isaac, you you one one day trial. Uh, yes. You were in prison, and you were sent to Angola, Angola uh, State Penitentiary. State Penitentiary. What you see right here is work. That's that's what the inmates they work in the field. It's twenty four thousand acres of misery, and they it's self contained. They grow everything. Anything that can be grown, that's what they grow from watermelons, the cantaloupes, the onions, the bell peppers, and potatoes. They grow everything on that, that land, that plantation. And they have hundreds of inmates, they have over 7,000 inmates there. And the field, that's where they work at when you first get there and you're supposed to be there for 90, you're supposed to stay in the field 90 days because it's cruel and unusual punishment. Uh, some guys, take, they'll take their finger and just chop it off to keep from going out there in that field. Some of them would pay somebody to chop their toe off to keep from going out there in the field. A lot of guys couldn't handle the field. Guys would pass out. And the only way you can come in from work, a horse. You see the horse right here? A horse would have to pass out. If the horse don't pass out, you, you're not supposed to pass out. So... Uh, it was cruel and unusual punishment, and, and, and that's what we did. We worked in the field, uh, and I stayed in that field for 11 years. 
And it's worth, it's worth pointing out also, right, um, part of this whole um, history of the prison system in the United States, Angola State Penitentiary li literally was a slave plantation uh, pr prior to yes. being a, a prison. And if that, if that looked a heck of a lot like a slave plantation, that was 1982. That was a picture from 1982. That was not from the 1800s. You want to say a little bit about this? This is, uh, this is, this is A block. This is the cell block. Uh, I was sentenced to on extended lockdown. And it was like two men to a cell. Uh, and a lot of things used to happen in that cell block. And even the guards there were so corrupt they would even, they would open your cell at midnight when you sleep for another inmate to go in there to try and rape you or stab you. It didn't take but a few dollars, maybe uh, 20, 30 dollars. If you got money, you can pay an officer, say, look, I need you to let me in cell such and such at this time, about maybe 2 o'clock in the morning when he sleep. And if you give him 20, 30 dollars, He'll open your cell while you sleep. So that's what they was doing. They would, they, uh, they, so your life was always at risk. You, you was never actually safe. You had guys, you probably hear how you can sleep with one eye open and one eye closed. You would get so keen to hear a stick pin. If it hit the floor, you would open your eyes. You would hear anything because you were so tensed. And like I said earlier, that's that was the bloodiest penitentiary in America. So every day, somebody was getting killed. Right here is the shanks, the prison weapons that they used. They had machetes. They had uh, butcher knives. You know, they had all kind of things. They had brass knuckles. You can pay. They had even little. Uh, uh, they call these things zip guns. They make all this stuff in prison, you know, and it was like having an ID card. Everybody had a weapon. You had to have one to survive in there. If you didn't have a weapon, uh, you didn't have a chance. So everybody, you know, what you see right here is something all the inmates had. So, Isaac, that's where you were for about, what, 12 years, yeah, right? Yeah, um, I was there uh, for 12 and a half years. Until? Lori White. Uh, she's a judge now in New Orleans, and she, she's my friend. Uh, she was a lawyer at the time, and a young lawyer. She got on my case. She read about my case in the district attorney's office. And she volunteered. She wanted to help me. Uh, when she come visit me, you know, she uh, I she introduced herself to me, and, and, and she wanted to uh, work on the case. And I asked her why why you want to work on this case. She said because I believe you innocent. And I said you believe I'm innocent. How how you know what make you believe I'm innocent? She said I read your case. She said I want to work on your case. So. I happened to be her very first client as an attorney, uh, yeah, and it was a high-profile case, and I didn't think, I said, well, you know, this is a high-profile case, and this is going to be your first case, <laughs> why would you want to, and she said, I want to work on your case, and she worked on my case, and that's the reason I'm here right now, able to speak about it, because that lady was, uh, she was resistant, and she wouldn't give up. She wouldn't take no for an answer. She took me from one court to the other and kept climbing. When they denied me, she would file something else. And, uh, and like I said, right now today, she's, uh, she's my friend. We, we always in touch and yep. helps me in any way she could. Speaking of important women in your life, uh, <laughs> here's a picture of you and your mother, right? I'm, yes. Uh, Clara Lee, you want to say a little bit? So one of the, let me let me just say this before before you uh, share a little bit about that. So one of the things that had happened um, is that uh, Isaac had also already been working a bit with um, a, a, 
uh, what they call the jailhouse lawyer, a, a guy that was very interested in helping some of the, in, the inmates to, um, you know, get information about their case. His name was Burl Kane, right? And Burl Carter. Burl Carter. Okay, and he um, he suggested he was the first first one. Said you got to get the police file. Right. Right. Uh, the yeah, investigative new, report. Right. You need to get the, this Dillman, this Dillman file right. that it, the, it come to find out was what they needed, and. Uh, I, I love this. You're, you know, the part of the story where you asked your mom to get the Dillman file, right? And yeah. she actually found it, the police file. And this was a police file, right? This that, was a file that we wasn't entitled to, uh, which is not fair at all, but we was not entitled to the investigative report. We was entitled to the police report, but not the investigative report. And there was no way we can know what's on an investigative report, but this jailhouse lawyer, Burl Carter, that was serving 198 years himself, he was like a Johnny Cochran. He was one of the best, even though he was in prison, he didn't think he had an error in his own case, but he helped many people get out of prison that was serving a life sentence. And he said, we need to get that investigative report to find out what's on it. He said, because I'm reading your case and I see where you've been set up, but I need that investigative report. So I called my mama. I said, Mom, I said, Burl said, we need an investigative report. Uh, and we're not supposed to have it. I don't know how we can get it. But in two days, <laughs> my mom got that report. Right? She got that report, that investigative report. And she told me, Jerry, I have, she called me Jerry. My name is Isaac, but she called me Jerry. <laughs> she said, I have that investigative report that you asked for. And uh, when she sent it out there to me and Burrow, we looked at it. The uh, uh, of this, the exculpatory evidence that they withheld, the primary one, was that one week after the murder of my father, one block away from the Hyatt Regency, so one block away, uh, two men, two or three men, were arrested, and another, the, the arresting agent in that case actually sent a memo to Dillman to put in the police file saying that he was, he, he wanted to send this along because these men fit the description of the men who had killed my father, including that one of them had a sailor hat on, right? So it wasn't this, like, just, you know, kind of vague thing. And not only that, they actually had the gun, they held up this other couple, they had the murder weapon with one bullet out that, you know, a few days later was found, ballistic testing showed that it was the bullet, the one that was missing was the bullet that killed my father. That was the evidence that they did not share with the defense, right? I mean, that to me, it still gives me both nausea and chills every time I see, see it, you know? and. And, and it bifurcates, the pain bifurcates, right? There's the pain of knowing that they set this young boy up to take this fall knowing full well he wasn't the one that did it, right? On the other hand, you know, for my family, these were the people who killed my father. We never got justice, right? Um, from that point on, Isaac was released, in, you know, released from prison. Let's go here. Uh, the Innocence Project. This is Isaac in the Innocence Project. I'll, I'll move on beyond that. But part of the story on our end was that nobody told my family. Nobody called us to say that, that um, the killer of our father, the alleged killer of our father, had been exonerated. We knew nothing. Um, this was in 1992, you know, and they couldn't find the energy, the courage, our phone number, I don't know what to call us and say, okay, this, your, your father's murder is now an open murder case, right? So, um, I mean, it's truly horrendous, Yeah. right? Yeah. Um, so, uh, let's, let's um, if you don't mind, Isaac, let's move, move the story forward. Um, in the book is, you know, I want to say what Isaac was able to do after he was released from prison, I mean, and um, including you know, I, if I can brag about you for a minute. Um, yes. He, yeah. <laughs> 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 
you know, and, and it, 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 he, was, he was one bout shy. He was one bout, bout shy from going to the 1992 Barcelona Olympics in boxing. You know, this was, this was a, a man, a young man, who after coming out of serving prison, you know, 12, 13 years in Angola, through the prime of his boxing career, came out and actually started again, you know. Try, it, it, box, you know, boxed your butt off, right? Yeah, I, uh, that's all I knew. And, and that was, like I said, that was my way of escaping reality and relief and tension in prison uh, when I found out that boxing was huge while I was there. Uh, in fact, some other guys that knew me went to the Wharton and told the Wharton that they have a guy here now. He can fight. He can box. And Wharton's bet money on the fighters in, in, uh, in prison. Oh. So you fighting against like about maybe 19, 20 different prisons uh, that, that has boxing. So they all comes to Angola because Angola is the biggest uh, penitentiary. And they would be in one huge, like an arena uh, inside the prison. And these wardens be from all these other prisons and they bet on their fighters. They make money off their fighters. And so the warden come talk with me when I was in the cell block. And he said, I heard you can box real good. And I didn't, at the time, I was so angry for being there. I said, no, I don't want to box. And in my heart, that was my first love, boxing. You know, just like you have basketball players, football players. That's something that they love. Boxing was something that I loved, all I knew. And uh, I was already two-time Golden Glove champion and uh, three-time Silver Glove champion at, at age 12 years old. You know, I was nine years old when I started boxing. And that when I was accused of that crime, I was training for the Junior Olympics then. So, of course, after serving all this time and lost all my young good years in prison, when I came home, Lori, uh, Judge Lori, got me out. She asked me, said, what you want to do now? When I got out, I said, well, I want to go back to the gym and try to make it to the Olympics. And uh, coincidental, it was the 92 Olympics. And we know the Olympics come around with every four years. Well, that year was the year of the Olympics again. And they were saying that it's no way possible that you can make it because you didn't get out in time. If you would have got out six months ago, yeah, you have time to try and make it to the Olympics. But you would have to fight 17 fights. You would have to win 17 fights because this is an elimination bout to make it to the trials, to the uh, 92 Olympic uh, trials in Barcelona, Spain. And the Sanks training camp, Sanks head coach, uh, defensive coach, remember Steve Sitwell was the Sanks coach? He came along with Pat Swillen, Ricky Jackson, and Sam Mills. They came to, uh, to represent me, and they was willing to help me in any way they can. And they told the boxing commissioner, said, well, we want to know from him. They said, why? Why is it too late? They said, because he can't get rest. He would have to fight every day, 17 fights, and he would have to win all 17. And he would have to go from state to state. And how could he do that? And Steve Sitwell looked at me and he said, you think you can do it? I said, yeah, I had enough rest in prison. <laughs> <laughs> so... They, uh, we used their private jet, and they would send me from place to place. I won all 17 fights by knockout, and I made it to the trial. <laughs> Some of y'all heard of Oscar De La Hoy. Well, he was my roommate. <laughs> he was my roommate in the Olympic trials. Yes, and uh, he was the only one that won a gold in the 92 Olympics, Barcelona, Spain. And uh, I was one of the first people to call him the golden boy. <laughs> and that's how he got that name. That's great. Yeah. So while you're doing that, right, we're, <laughs> you know, our family's just moseying along, trying to do, you know, trying to get on with our lives. and. Uh, so that's 92, and years passed, 2005 comes along, and uh, this is Gary Perkinson, he's the, my um, younger sister Nancy's husband, he's an editor, spends a lot of time on the computer, and one day he just decided to sit down at the computer and Google Isaac Knapper. <laughs> uh, this time, one of the funny things, he, he had done it before, but he didn't realize Isaac's name 
was spelled with a K. He was spelling it with an N. So nothing ever came up. This time he, he, uh, you know, he starts Googling it, and all of a sudden, whoa! Every, you know, Isaac's wrongful conviction comes up. The, you know, the entire history of what happened in Louisiana, the fact that he had been, you know, a, a star boxer, and you know, as Gary said at the time, he just sit back and thought, oh shit, how am I, gonna, <laughs> how am I going to tell the family this, right? So he does. Um, fortunately, Nancy Banks, <laughs> my sister Nancy Banks. By that time, I was a, a mother of my uh, then, I think they were six-year-old twins um, at the time. So uh, fortunately, Nancy Banks, uh, who is the youngest child of uh, my father, Dr. Banks, and also his protege in that she had already gotten her doctorate, uh, or was just finishing her doctorate, I think, her PhD in history uh, at Columbia. And she took this on, trying to get the case opened. You know, she reached out to uh, the DA's, DA's office, the police department, um, you know, and of course, every, every step of the way, we would hit roadblocks. I mean, I don't know that people were out outwardly rude until they actually stopped calling back, but they basically were s saying things like, so sorry, not our jurisdiction, they should have called you, they didn't, you know, water over the dam um, for most of us. Uh, <laughs> and what happened? So as life was going on, uh, we got nowhere. We got a couple articles written. I think one was in the Camden Herald. There might even have been a young boy. Um, I mean, I can't, I can't emphasize that enough, what it is like to have your own messy life, you know, the vortex of that, pull in a person that had nothing to do with it, right? And to learn, you know, that I, I had such shame about it for the longest time, to learn that my, my family was associated and in fact, you know, in a sense, we were complicit in it, right? We believed what we were told. We didn't question. We didn't think there was, you know, we didn't think there was racism going on. We didn't even question it. Um, that was simply devastating. And it kind of sat there and ate away at me for many, many years. And finally, 2015 came around. Um, I'm going to be sure we get through this part, Isaac. 2015 came around for me, and what happened, these are, my, these are my twins. It was about that time. This, I think, was their 16th birthday. And for, for, I, I'm a psychiatrist, so I, um, you know, I was aware, and I, and I work in the field of trauma, right? So I'm aware that um, when your kids become the age that you are when, when something happens that, that, you know, that you may very well be quite dysregulated <laughs> by it. And, in fact, that's what was happening, and I just thought, I, you know, I don't know what else to do. Jamie and Alex, I, every, every breath they took, every time I saw them, they were kind of living, breathing reminders of how young Isaac and I were um, at the time of that murder and what we had been through. And I made a plan that I would try to reach out. Um, I was in Pennsylvania at the time, and one night I just uh, Googled Lori White myself. I thought maybe, maybe she, I could find out from her something about this. And so I, I found this nondescript um, email address. It was like, I found first that she is, was now a, a judge, not just a lawyer. Um, and it was like a judge law at, you know, some nondescript thing. And I sent an email basically that said, you know, I'm the daughter of D uh, Dr. Banks and I understand you uh, were involved in getting Isaac exonerated and I really would like to find out more about it. And I really expected that this would be a long wait, right? The way bureaucracies and this kind of thing work. And, in fact, she uh, sent me an email in about back within 12 hours. Um, and in um, 2015, uh, after I talked with her a bit, she talked to Isaac and I said, geez, do you think he would be willing to meet us? I'd love to meet him and find out. She told us that he you know, had just been released from uh, a federal sentence and uh, he was transitioning and uh, I, you know, uh, earlier today, we were interviewed for something, and I, you know, people always are asking, what, what do you, what you, what were you thinking? <laughs> you know, kind of what, what, what were you thinking at the time, and what did you need? And I didn't even know what we needed. I, I didn't know. I just needed information. Um, so, to that December 2015, Nancy and I, my sister Nancy and I, jumped on a plane and went to New Orleans to meet Isaac, his wife Denise, and Lori White. This is a picture of that time. Um, let me just see what the next picture is. Um, and I want to say a couple of things. I mean, and, um, and Isaac, you can certainly share your experience too, but um, first of all, there was such a resonance the minute I saw him. Um, 
you know, I, uh, Lori had sent this picture. No, I took out the picture. Lori had sent the. No, I didn't. There it is. Lori had sent the, this picture to me shortly after, and you know, she said something about, "Geez, he's a big guy now." You know, he's been boxing, and um, you know, I looked at that picture and I was like, "Yeah, he doesn't look menacing." You know, this Isaac Napper that had been created. Um, you know, when we met him, um, you know, his warmness, his generosity was palpable. Um, we sat in Lori, Lori's office for, you know, a good couple of hours, uh, Isaac, with Isaac telling us the details of what had happened to him, his arrest and all of that. And um, the, the part of the story that it was, you know, there have been many things that have been transformative to me, but the part of the story that um, still moves me to tears was um, Denise at one point, his wife, um, as, as we were hearing all of the brutality, I mean, and, and Tip of the iceberg. I mean, when, you, when and if you read the book, it, it, what Isaac has been exposed to and his family has been exposed to is just unspeakable, um, unspeakable in my, my um, estimation. Um, but so Denise said, geez, you know, that must have been so hard, hard for you or something like that. And I, you know, what was it like for you when my father was murdered? And, you know, Nancy and I were sitting, sitting there um, in our, you know, in our main, you know, uh, um, there's been nothing like it in my life before or since, quite frankly. Um, you know, from there, do you want to say anything about that, Isaac? I mean, it was such a profound. Yes, it, it was. Like Nancy, uh, Amy said, I used to think about Nancy all the time uh, when I read in the newspaper because they kept having different articles in the newspaper concerning a crime that was committed. And I read that Dr. Banks had a young daughter uh, that was eight years old and so I would think about her all the time and it, it, it was like a day didn't pass that she didn't flash my mind and I would feel like wow what could she be going through she done lost her father she's only eight years old she's a baby you know a little kid and when I met her when Lori or uh, Judge Lori called me and asked she uh, brought it to my attention that Dr. Amy Banks had contacted her and wanted to meet me, and that was the daughter of uh, Dr. Banks. And I thought about it, and she said, you don't have to answer right now. You can wait. If she call me back in a couple of days or whatever, and then you can let me know, and I'll contact her and let her know. So I said, no, I can answer that right now. And I said, if it would help any, uh, I don't mind meeting them. And she said, okay, you show. I said, I'm positive. And that's how Lori got back in contact you know, with Amy. And uh, they made preparations to come down to New Orleans. And so when she said I asked for a hug and wanted to embrace uh, Nancy, yes, I definitely wanted to embrace her and looking in her face and after thinking about that baby she was, you know, uh, it, it relieved a whole lot of tension and pain out of my heart. You know, when I hugged her, every family, you know, I love Amy, you know, I love Nancy, you know, I love Judy, you know, and, and so we family. So from there, you know, after that, we really spent the weekend together. I mean, I can't tell you, uh, they were, Denise and Isaac were so generous in that conversation. We had said, they, you know, Nancy and I wanted the court transcripts. We wanted information about the murder, and Isaac had this. And not only that, but we had talked about, you know, about writing a book, actually, as early in our first meeting. And I found out that Isaac had, um, while he was in a, a federal sentence, he had written a 400-page manuscript. So he had already done his work, right? And, uh, you know, so I, I'll show you, if, as we're winding down here, I'll show you a series of slides um, of, oh dear, and that didn't happen. Um, you know, so as, as I like to say, the series of just surreal moments you can imagine. So, you know, we came here hoping, is that okay? You guys here? Yeah. Um, you know, hoping to maybe get a little bit of information about this, and, and we left with, you know, um, a new family. Uh, but, you know, these are some of the, the pictures that I just, you know, still to this day just 
um, shock me. Here we are, like the next day, we made plans to go to Kinko's Copy and copy all of this stuff. So there is Denise, I don't know if you can see in the background, but Isaac there with his glasses perched on his nose, you know. And again, you know, we're printing and collating all of this information um, together. Um, Isaac took us to his gym. If, here he is pointing to a picture of him when he was, uh, you know, much younger. Well, not much younger. I'm sorry, Isaac. Uh, a little younger, a little younger, and, uh, you know, kind of, as you can see, quite buff. Uh, here, here we are at his, uh, at his gym. I'd like to say there's a picture that isn't up here of me hitting the bag. Um, but, you know, it was, it, you know, again, to be able to see Isaac's world, what he loved, you know, this, this, it was like, this is who he is, you know, he's a boxer. Um, it was just amazing. I'm not going to talk about the pros prosecution. I want to, um, but if there, you know, we'll have a little time for question and answers if anybody wants to ask. Because also during that time there, Nancy and I actually met also with the prosecuting attorney. He did not know that we. Apparently, I'm talking about it. He didn't know that we had just <laughs> that we had just uh, met Isaac. Um, we really wanted to go in there cold and see what he had to say, and basically. Um, it, uh, basically, the first thing he said to us was, I'm absolutely sure that Isaac was the one that killed your father. Um, you know, and as proof of that, the minute he came out, he did uh, thus and so. I think he went right back to prison. I think he's there now. You know, he clearly didn't have any idea. And, and But, you know, what I walked away from that was, this is how this happens. The level of systemic racism, the level of um, un, un, uh, unexamined uh, bias was profound. We brought up, you know, you know this evidence and this evidence and this evidence, and he had a very, a very uh, slippery <laughs> uh, explanation for everything. It was, de you know, just deferred, just deferred. Yeah, no, that. Oh, they, they all shared the gun. That's why the gun was over there. You know, Isaac did have it, but then these other people got it. You know, every, you know, every, every, every thing he said, and then to kick off just an unbelievably surreal weekend. Uh, we went to Angola um, prison. Uh, and, you know, to say that, I mean, it, it, it's like, um, it, it, clearly it leaves me a little speechless to be able to go back to the place where Isaac was imprisoned wrongly for, you know, um, wrongly convicted for killing my father um, and seeing what you had been through you know, where you had been. I remember, you know, the thing that still stays with me, and I don't know if you remember this, but at one point we were walking down the hall and, you know, I was right, I was right beside you and you said, you were looking at the, the place that you went to when you first got there and you had already yeah. told us that just horrific right. story Honestly. about how scary it was. And I could literally feel him sort of shaking, you know. Um, but also kind of going from place to place and seeing the friends that you had met, right? Um, I don't know. <laughs> this was a prison van that we drove around with. In here's Isaac. Um, this was one of Isaac's very group of students, and um, uh, I can't tell you how riveted these students were, how engaged these young people were in listening to Isaac talk about what had happened to him. I mean, you can see it there. You can capture it there. I mean, it was a very moving um, experience. This is us afterwards at dinner, right? Um, and this is what we're doing, right? Wrongful convictions can happen. I want to end, and Isaac, I certainly will have you, um, you know, chime in with anything you want to end with, but I want to end with um, uh, just a couple of paragraphs from the end of our book. That um, So uh, when we were going from Angola, um, when we left Angola to go back to, uh, we, we, Nancy and I were flying out to New York that night, and we left uh, Angola, and Denise and Isaac gave Nancy and I a ride. It was a couple hours from Angola to the prison, and you know, every every uh, we would, and Nancy and I were just in the back seat. I'm just clamoring for you know, kind of more information and stories. And Isaac, I mean, the one thing that I, you know, that that just struck me, you know, really in the gut was that you would talk about your life, and every single story ended with a friend, uh, a family member, who was killed shot, wrongly convicted, I mean, one right after another, you know, and listening to what your experience had been, um, what your life experience had been, right, period. I don't, we don't even get into, you know, breaking it up, was staggering to me. You know, here, here, 
you know, I saw what happened to my family with one murder. Yeah, yes, it was my father, and that was devastating. It was horrendous. But to hear, you know, the losses that you had incurred along the way um, in a system that was so relentlessly racist um, was just horrifying, right? Um, so what I want to say is, so as this, this is a... Uh, um, as a parting gift, he said simply, it feels like I'm saying goodbye to family. And at that moment, I knew that we'd be okay, that we wouldn't lose each other, because we had both lost so much already in ways over which we had no control. Family. It's such a simple word that describes a built-in sense of belonging. Some families you're born into, others you choose, and still others, in rare cases, you're thrust into. Our lives, so disparate in every way, blew up together on April 12, 1979. And in many ways, we've all been spir spiraling out of control, fighting to steady ourselves against the power of that explosion. And finally, through the years, through the pain, through the losses, as our lives whirled by each other's, we reached out a hand, touched each other, and simply held on. Questions. I, I also want to say, um, as we're heading to the questions, on, you know, this isn't just something that happens in New Orleans, right? This is happening all over America. Um, in our area, there's something called the New England Innocence Project. It's based in Boston. There are two handouts there um, that has information both on wrongful conviction, but also in ways that you can get involved. If this story compels you to do something, please get involved, donate, share our story. The New England Innocence Project desperately needs pro bono lawyers. If you know one, if you are one, pick up a case. This is happening. The numbers are staggering, you know, of people that are still locked up, um, as Isaac was. Do you know? Yes. Well, we'll be open for questions if anybody. Yes. Sure. And uh, thank you both so much. Uh, you've got several questions for you, but I also, there have been several references to family members, and I want to do introductions, if I could. Uh, you referred to your sister, Nancy, Dr. Dan Nancy Banks, right here. Uh, stand up. Stand up. <laughs> yeah. Isaac's wife, Denise Knapper. and Amy's partner, Judy Jordan. Uh, just incredible. Uh, if you have not, if you're not aware of it already, uh, in your programs it talks about how you can pose questions and we're going to feed those to them to, for the sake of time. Uh, there's a QR code. Uh, if you have a smartphone, just point your smartphone at the QR code in your program. It's right on the inside there, and that will take you to a form, and you just type in your question there, and uh, that'll end up with me. Uh, well, let me just start. Today, uh, when you came to campus, you had a very emotional visit over to Stevens Hall, where not only your dad taught, we walked by East Annex, where his office was, but you also went to, into Alice Stewart, uh, the Alice Stewart room at Stevens Hall, where there's a portrait of your dad on display. Do you want to talk about how that affected you? When was the last time you had been in that building? And uh, for both of you, you as somebody who has been there many times, Isaac as somebody who has never been there, and you were confronting a huge part of your life. Would you like to address that? No. Okay. <laughs> um. Boy, uh, you know, you, when I come back to the university, right, it's, it's not just the, uh, it wasn't just the image. I mean, I'm looking at a portrait of my father, right? Um, uh, it's a classic one that, that uh, you know, I've seen a hundred times at his desk, a big smile on his face, looking just like my son, actually, um, which is one of those, you know, kind of wonderful things about life, right, is that you can, you can have your parents back through your kids. Um, 
uh, bringing Isaac there, you know, to that space. Uh, you know, I felt like it, it felt like it was interesting. It felt, uh, I mean, I felt a big relief. You know? yeah. It was, like I said, very emotional. Yeah. Thinking yeah. about what they went through, what I went through being accused of. It. You know? it's, a, it's a story everybody needs to know and need to hear about. It would change the world. Uh, we had a question, uh, Isaac. Uh, were you able to take any legal action against the state for what happened to you? What happened was Judge Lori White, which was my attorney at the time, she filed for the wrongly conviction uh, and tried to get me compensated. Uh, we filed for, I think, about uh, something like $13 million, a million dollars a year. And <coughs> At the time, uh, during that time when my case got exonerated, the case lasted on for a couple of years, and, and they, uh, they was immune to malicious prosecution, meaning that we tried to sue the state of Louisiana, Detective John Dillman, the, uh, uh, District Attorney Harry Connick, and they was all under immunity. They was immune to malicious prosecution, meaning that they couldn't be sued. All they can do is just give me my freedom. And a year later, they came with the law. They used my case to bring that law in where they have to pay you for being wrongly convicted now. And I couldn't refile because the statute had run out. But people that come after me, they get paid now. So essentially, you got no compensation All right, nothing. for those 13 years Right. and what you lost. Yeah. Jerry. I just got a couple of things to say. <clears throat> One is, can you hear me? Yes. <laughs> okay. That's what I think is the thing that you should think about. What you're saying is language that is taken for granted when we talk about the criminal legal system is quote unquote corrections. So it was directed to actually to Isaac and maybe both of you. In your experience with incarceration in this brutal system, Isaac, what was being corrected? Uh, that, that's a good question. <laughs> what was being corrected? Uh, I mean, what nothing really been uh, corrected. You know, it, it was just something that happened and, and, that, and, and was wrong. Uh, what they should have been corrected. You know, the system should have been corrected, mm -hmm. and uh, and they was they was not corrected. Yeah, yeah I, I would agree with that. I mean, I don't think there was anything in this story that's about correction, right? <laughs> Except maybe the end of us finding each other yeah. and you know developing a, a relationship despite what has happened. Um, but you know, for people, you know, it sounds like some people are familiar with the criminal. I think. I think people aren't even using justice system anymore because there is no justice in the system, right? It's a criminal legal system. And uh, it, it, in many, many cases, is so far, it's so deeply uh, embedded in uh, systemic racism that it, it, you know, it's almost like a throwaway, you gotta start over. I mean, and, and you know, I mean, as, as you say, particularly in Angola, all of the guys there, right, were there for either, you know, most of them for murder, right? Yeah. Wrongfully convicted or not, and there was no rehabilitation, right? There was work to feed, you know, to feed everybody, right? Work, right. work you to a bone, but there was no hope for getting out. So there was no reason to educate, to, you know, do anything like that. Some of that has changed, but I mean, you need to. This is something that needs to be rehabbed from, you know, every step of the way from the from the police or out on the street to the, the prosecutors, to uh, the district attorney's offices. I mean, this is, the entire system has to be redone. You know, Laura said no, no, rebuil, no uh, uh, rehabilitation. You know, she's so right. At 17 years old, I had to write the governor trying to get in school while I was in Angola. And yeah. they refused to put me in school. They said, you serve a life sentence. You would never be free. You don't need an education. So I couldn't even get in school. 
why I was in prison because I was serving a life sentence. So what kind of rehabilitation that is, I don't know. Here's another one that might be sensitive. And sorry, I'm forewarning, okay. you. I'm forewarning you now. You're uh, looking at me. I am because this starts with you and then that's okay. a little different question for Isaac. Okay. You're a psychiatrist. Mm -hmm. You deal with people who have trauma in their lives. Yep. How much of your career was rooted in what happened to your dad? 100%? <laughs> do, do you go 100, over 100%? <coughs> yeah. Not sensitive at all. <laughs> Not sensitive at all. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. No, without a doubt. I mean, I have been preoccupied with trauma and stewing on this and, you know, working with people and um, without a doubt. And Isaac, your career, you have a career, uh, and we were talking about it earlier, but uh, you got back into boxing, and you're a trainer, and you, uh, can, do you want to talk a little bit about what you're doing now with your, uh, your training facilities and what's ahead on that? Yeah. Well, what I, I do is I train, I train little kids, uh, and we don't just teach uh, boxing. We teach discipline. Uh, we try and educate these kids. We have a lot of uh, kids that you know, live in, in, that's in poverty, uh, that don't have no guidance, that don't have uh, places to go, parks to go. You know, they play football in the street right in front of their house, you know, and, uh, and they, they constantly into other things that they shouldn't be into. So we try to take those kids in, in a gym, and teach them discipline, and if you see these kids, we would get some trouble kids. We got good kids too, but most of them, when they come there, uh, they have trouble in school. But when they, after about maybe 30, 40, 50 days, they become uh, a class A uh, students and uh, very disciplined. We get good feedback from their parents. They come there and say, wow, it's like we babysit, but we, uh, we don't mind. We don't mind. If it's going to save one of those kids' life, we don't mind. And I, I, we train these kids. We take them to compete. We travel to bring them to compete. And we have some, I uh, wish i show you the pictures. We have kids. We got about maybe 35 or 40 kids at a time that we take. And, uh, and we teach them everything. We even go to their school. If they have any problems at school, their parents don't go. We as coaches go. And they don't want to see us when we come there. When we come there, we would tell them, get out, give me some push-ups in front of the whole class. And they'd be like, oh. So they make sure that they, and they'd be so excited to bring us their report card to show us that they done passed every class and, you know, and excited. So I enjoy what I do working with these kids. But I, and I have another job. I'll be over to Mayweather uh, Fitness Gym. Mayweather, y'all heard about him, the champion. Uh, he's opening up two gyms in the state of Louisiana, and uh, they offered me the job to uh, to be the head instructor over the Mayweather franchise. So. We have a question, and I think there's going to be an easy way to answer this one. Have you considered commissioning your story for some kind of production? This gives you an opportunity to talk about one of our guests who's over here right now. Yeah, so, so as, as our story has unfolded and as we've been, you know, doing more and more, um, we've got a publisher, obviously, and, and whatnot. And, and actually, I think it was, um, it may have been from the, an article that was in the Bangor Daily News about, I don't know, maybe four or five months ago um, about the, what we were doing. Um, we, we had a, a few documentary film people reach out to us. Um, and uh, so we had a few. Um, I do want to just say uh, the whole process, some of the question we have here is the whole process of putting together the book, Isaac doing his manuscript, you doing your own part too. How did that process work and how did it affect your relationship? Did it, I mean, in, in what ways did it affect your relationship reading his man, manuscript right. and adding your, your story? That's a good question. I mean, I certainly, 
you know, reading your manuscript, um, I learned so much more about you, about your background, and um, you know, and and you know, and I'll, uh, for instance, and it, and it was layers, right? I mean, you can read somebody's story, and then you need to read it again and again and again, and you know, it was interesting. Um, uh, early on, I, I wanted to make sure I it, it had included in much of your boxing stuff because I knew how dear that was to you, right? And I really wanted to honor that. And you know, um, it, in the editorial process, um, you know, somebody said, "Oh, you know," one of my editors, uh, our editors, said, "You know, you know, is there some more background, you know, about your your upbringing and all of that?" We I had put in some of it, you all know, right. and we had in there. Um, I went back and read, and lo and behold. I had, I had, I mean, I'm, I'm embarrassed to say this. I mean, I'm horrified to say this, but I had, for, I had forgotten the story of your um, stepfather having been beaten up by the police when you were five or six years old mm -hmm. and dying, yeah. right? You know, and so you know, as I, as as we're folding these things in, I mean, there's just more and more and more trauma, you know, um, you know, and and added that in so that you know people really got a. a you know, a deeper sense of, you know, what what you were up against. Um, and lest we go into the narrative of, oh, you know, it was all just a struggle, I also want to point out that, you know, one of the things that, that um, I was um, so moved by in reading about you and certainly over time in getting to know you better is how deeply connected your family is and how, you know, your mother's just... Um, non-stop devotion to trying to free you, to visit you, to, you know, I mean, you know, she, to this day, is my heroine. I mean, you know, uh, but so, it, so it really, it deepened our relationship for me, just in my knowledge of you, and, um, you know, what, what would you say? I don't know. You know, I, I, I say that it brought us closer. We got to know each other better. Yeah. Yeah, and like uh, I think yesterday we drove that long drive. Yeah. And I think I was on everybody else was dozing off to sleep. But we got a chance. We got a chance to talk. It was about a four and a half, five hour drive. Yep. And we we just talked the whole drive, and yeah. it, I felt good. Yeah, it was yeah, great. We got a chance to learn other things about each other. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And one of the things that that you know th through this process that I've learned is how much alike we are. You know, yeah. and that's been one of the really, um, you know, I feel like I have such a, a kindred spirit, you know. Um, I, I feel like we kind of think about life a lot in the same ways and, yeah. you know, kind of the ways we've approached, you know, horrific things happening, right? I mean, yeah. um, so, it, you know, it's been such an honor and such a gift for me to, to develop this friendship. Yeah, that's right. Know? Well, I... In, an incredible story, incredibly painful. Thank you so much for sharing it with us, and not just with this audience, but with the folks who are going to read your book. Yeah, and you. uh, we're excited. It's we, we have advanced copies here. Yep. It officially is published on November 5th. Yep. Uh, so uh, again, I encourage you. I know many of you want to do this already, but uh, come over here. They'll be over there to sign, uh, aut autograph your books for you. Uh, but again, please help me thank uh, both thank Amy you. and Amy. Thank you all for coming. Yeah, thank you.